Welcome back to CFO Weekly, where we're talking with financial leaders about how to build efficiency in their teams, create time for strategy, and ultimately get results with your host, Megan Weiss. Let's jump right in. Today, my guest is Stephen Nutt. Stephen has over 27 years in accounting and finance, with 21 of those years spent within community banking. Most recently, he serves as the CFO at Community National Bank and Trust of Texas, an 830 million asset community bank with 15 branches across North Texas. Since joining the bank, he's overseen asset growth of 65%, stock value increase of 60%, and a 68% increase in tangible book value. Prior to joining Community National, Stephen held CFO, CRO, and controller positions with several banks in Georgia. With extensive experience ranging from de novo institutions to a $2 billion bank holding company. His focus has been in strategy pertaining to asset and liability management, acquisitions and valuation to maximize performance balanced with risk management. Stephen is a licensed CPA and received an MBA from Brunel University and a BBA in economics from Harding University. He serves as a board member of Youth Reach International a worldwide organization that mentors vulnerable youth and helps prepare them for success. He also serves on the Accounting Program Advisory Committee and Strategic Planning Committee for Navarro College in Corsicana, Texas. Wow, Stephen, a very impressive background. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Megan. I appreciate the opportunity to share and and talk with you today. Yeah, I think our listeners are really going to enjoy today's topic the evolving role of the CFO and earning a seat at the strategic table. So looking at your own experience, how have you seen your roles as a CFO change in recent years? And how are you bringing more value to the company? I think that a lot of things go into that, Megan. And, but the biggest thing is uh, kind of a buzzword that I've, I've heard and, and taken to heart is that Try to deliver insight instead of numbers. And I'll give you an example of that is one of the things we do here is have our meetings every once a week. And one of those weeks is my turn to educate or, or to bring the numbers for the prior month. And a lot of times when we're doing presentations like that in the past, accounting accountants give a whole bunch of numbers. And I've, I've always felt like it was more important to tell the story behind the numbers and, and get into the why and the, not just the what, but the why. And, and so that kind of moves you from a transactional CFO into a strategic CFO. And when I think about that, I think of a, a mentor I had a few years back, actually, at one of my bosses. And, and we had this discussion about it from an accounting role. How do you add value to an organization? Because... You know, we're really a cost center, and it, and it feel you kind of feel like that I'm kind of a drag on the company or organization instead of adding value. So one of the things he told me that I thought was very important, especially in community banking, was he said if you can learn and really know the asset liability management side of the job, mm-hmm. you are adding value to the company. And what he meant by that is is from a banking standpoint, the, our largest way to make money is our net interest margin. That accounts for about 80% of our revenue. And so how you manage that assets and the liability to maximize that margin, but also reduce the uh, exposure for the company really adds value. And I think that's something that we've tried to do. And I've always tried to do is share how that works with the, with the stakeholders, especially the employees about how they can affect those numbers. And when you start doing that, you start being able to bring value to the function and and you start being able to have other people understand their role and it kind of all works together. And so I think that's been one of the biggest changes is is to go from just the what of the numbers to the why of the numbers. Yeah, I think that that's great advice. I think in general, accounting has always focused on backward looking. And like you said, I think it's important to tell a story with numbers and, and try to be more predictive and, and future looking. I think, and I think that we're seeing that and we'll get into some questions, I think, on data. And that's a big thing, data-driven organizations. And 
And that's allowed, I think, CFOs to, to, to look forward instead of backwards and, yeah. and to be able to, to affect change. And so one of the roles I had at the, the $2 billion uh, holding company was running a modeling system. And so that really gave me insight into how, how I can affect and how I can do what if analysis and those type of things to be able to, to show where we're going and where we want to be. And, and I think that's much more valuable than just always looking in the rear view mirror. And so I've always kind of felt like that was my, my role and take that on, you know, in board meetings, when I'm meeting with board members, they're, they're all business owners, but they're not necessarily day-to-day -day bankers. So it, for me, a lot of it is educating them on what goes into the numbers. If I just come in and read off a bunch of numbers, they can look on it on a sheet and, and a report and, and see those numbers, but they, they really want to know what's behind that and, and what is going on to affect the change. Yeah. So what skills do you think are necessary for this new, more strategic CFO? I think there are several that are different and evolving, as you mentioned, but I still think you have to start with the basic accounting skills. Those are still important. You still have to be, as a CFO, you have to be the, the resource from an accounting standpoint, first and foremost. But I think to develop this other relationship, it, it is about relationship. It's soft skills. It's being able to communicate across a broad group, which in the past CPAs, and it's funny because we get pigeonholed and, and get that stereotype and yeah. we joke about it at the bank a lot, uh, you know, accounting jokes or, you know, those type of things. But they're, they've always been seen as the, the guy that sits in the corner and does the numbers with the pencil and, and really doesn't talk to other people. And I think that's a skill, while it's not something you can necessarily learn in school, it, it is a soft skill that you've got to be able to develop and, and handle and, and talk with other people and um, almost become like a salesperson. My, my granddad, who had an eighth grade education, owned his own business and was one of the best salesmen I knew. And he always wanted me to get into to banking because he, he was so – involved in his community and the banks and just the people there. And I felt like he always talked about relationships. He said, it's really about relationships and, and ha businesses. And so I think that helped me realize that I can merge the two. I can merge the accounting side and the, and the, the data and stuff that I enjoy, but also develop that relationship side and be able to communicate with people. And, and so I think that's important. I, Another thing that I think of when I hear your question is that accounting to me, accounting is the, lang the language of business. So I, I see myself as an interpreter. So whichever stakeholders I'm talking to, if I, if I launch into a bunch of accounting language, they, they really don't understand. Yeah. But if I, can, if I can put it into words that helps communicate with them, and that's not talking down to someone, that. That's sharing someone so that they can understand the big picture and, and understand where they're going, especially with the board or the employees or even our community. So I think those are, are skills that are needed. And then I, I think that like we talk about the data modeling side, that's becoming more and more important because you do have less time, a lot of more automation in the day-to-day -day reconcilements, the day-to-day -day transactional accounting. So you're able to spend more time on the data and the, the modeling and, and really being more of a consultant than just a, an accountant. Yeah, I think that's all great advice and definitely skills that set uh, a strategic CFO apart. Okay, so what role should a CFO play in setting the direction for his or her company? I mean, we always hear, you know, the CEO is this just is the strategic position in the company, but what role does a CFO play in setting that direction? I think there are several roles that the CFO needs to play, and, and it does have a lot to do with numbers. When you start looking at a strategic planning, we do that each year, and a lot of times a lot of people's strategic planning is very 
I would call it pie in the sky or, or not real detailed. It's, it's, a, it's an idea, it's a vision, it's a mission, which are all good. But once you get, get to really being strategic, you have to get down to the details. And I think that's where the, the CFO needs to come in. And so I think a lot of strategic planning needs to be more specific and needs, needs to start with, um, with the finance department about constraints and allocation of capital and those type of things before they can really get into any kind of product development or, or direction of the company. So I think it starts in, it starts there with the detailed planning uh, and, the, and then all of the decisions have to tie back to that. So I think that's one role. I think another is to be an innovation, innovator in IT and data. So I'm not an expert in, in IT, and I don't think a CFO needs to be a super expert in IT. You have hopefully have a, a good IT department, but you have to be a champion of IT. And I, I kind of, um, it kind of goes back to the relationship and being able to communicate with people because if you're able to champion an idea, if you cannot communicate that very well to other people or the CEO or the board, then a lot of times those ideas die. And I think so. I think a CFO has to be able to champion that. They have to be a supporter of, of the IT spend uh, in banking. You can see, especially like the big banks, Bank of America and, and Chase, and those guys spend billions of dollars on IT. And so for a community bank, we don't have that type of resource, but we still have to be strategic in our IT spend. And so I think partnering with the IT department, the CIO, and, and figuring out strategic ways to spend so that we do get some type of return on in our investment. I think those are areas where we can set a direction. And then not, not being afraid in those type of situations to, to fail. So you might try something, and it, a lot of times in the past, I've, I've seen this happen, especially in community banking, where we want to try to be innovative and it doesn't work. And so then we become gun shy to, to try to do it again. So I think you got to be willing to fail and then try to fix things. And then, and then lastly, I think the push and the push for a data organization is very important. It's data driven and it has to reside with the CFO because they're the, they're the ones that keep and, and try to analyze and, share the data across the organization. So I think those are the, the areas where I see my role to help set the direction for the company is, is through detailed planning, through innovation, through supporting IT, and then through data transparency across the organization. Yeah, great advice. No discussion these days is complete without mentioning the current situation in the world. So how will you position your company to weather COVID-19 storm or any other storm for that matter in the future? I think there's a, there's several things that we've done and, and I do in my role that, that help to mitigate the risk of those type of scenarios. And so when you think about crisis like COVID-19 and as horrible as it's been and unpredictable as it's been, the banking industry especially is not a stranger to crisis. You, you think about 2008 and the financial crisis, you look, you know, 2000, you had the dot-com bust, you had late early nineties, you had the oil crisis. And, and so there's just always something going on. It seems like a pretty good business cycle. So you really, we, a lot of people try to label this, this is like a black swan when it's really not from a banking standpoint, we, we are prepared for these things. And the thing to do in my estimation, first off, it is a risk appetite that, that you have to have really from the top, from the board. And, and that has to drive a lot of your decisions, but you have to be in it for the long term. You have to create buffers so that you can weather those type of storms. And one of the ways to, to do that falls into my purview, and that is doing stress testing. We do a lot of stress testing of our loan portfolio, of our capital, and how 
you know, worst case scenarios and then, and then try to build buffers and within that, but also you don't want to ham, hamstring yourself so that you can't grow. And so it's really finding that balance and having then, and then having some contingency plans and monitor, monitor those plans and have triggers in place so that we can enact some different strategy should that happen, should something happen. It's, it's very similar in this situation. We had spent a couple of months last fall working on a strategic plan, very detailed strategic plan for 2020 and beyond. Mm-hmm. And, and so then, then obviously in March, there's a 175 per, uh, basis point drop in the interest rate by the, by the Fed. And then the, COVID-19 and all the shutdowns and you can basically take that strategic plan and throw it in the trash yep. because it, it, it just changed. And so being able to be agile and, and adapt in those type of situations is important. And that's how you, I think, go about this. And so you got to be able to change direction fairly quickly. And, and we did that and, and we, uh, we do have a conservative board, a conservative mindset so we do have some of those put things in place so that we can absorb some some hits and and still be able to show growth and 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 continue on because i think one of the things we value is consistency over volatility so while in the past year after the financial crisis in in 2008 i i went through that in georgia which was one of the worst places that you hit by that and, and you saw a lot of, you know, building and construction and real estate just values drop in half or more. And it, I heard a lot of bankers say, well, you know, that'll change the way we, we do business. We won't go after these loans. And, and then I see three years, three or four years later, that once the economy started coming back, people out doing the same crazy stuff with, you know, subprime lending and, and, and different things like that. And they're chasing that profit and the temporary and the quick profit over being a consistent and being um, a risk, you know, measuring your risk and, and doing wisely and investing wisely. And so I think that's a, a position we've taken here and that I think we'll continue to take. And, and it helps in these types of situations so that you don't get too, too high or too low. And, and, and it's really, it kind of goes back to asset liability management for me because we have to manage interest rate risk at a bank. And so we want to try to manage that as low as we can as far as volatility because we're always in an environment where the Fed may raise rates or they may lower rates, and that has a huge impact on our income and our balance sheet. So we try to want to be as risk uh, interest rate risk neutral as we can that's one what we have done here and it's one way we'll continue to position ourselves so that in in, in case of crisis we'll be able to withstand that and and, and move on yep so it, it's one thing to talk about uh, implementing strategic decision making but it's another thing to kind of convince the company to move in that direction. So how can a CFO along with the CEO help to establish a company culture that supports strategic decision-making? There's a couple of things that I think are important. And first and foremost is a relationship between the CFO and the CEO. I think it has to be transparent. It has to be based on trust and, and you have to, be on the same page. I, I think a lot of times if, if the senior management is not on the same page, then it, it really uh, makes any kind of strategic planning harder because you just, you don't, there's not buy-in. And so I think that's the first and foremost. And in the role of a CFO, traditionally, it's a, is someone that, that you should be able to trust. They're, they're people that, you know, from the CPA side, we have ethics exams and we have those type of certifications. So that is something that you want to be able to trust. But so you got to have that relationship first and foremost. But then I think you have to 
really start looking at how you create value in the organization. And, and so a CEO, their job is, is to create value and to, to increase the value for shareholders. And, and so how do I support that? And I think that's really what the modeling does. You're able to go out and, and, and look at different scenarios and see if, if uh, what will happen should different things change. And, and it, it supports the strategy numerically that the CEO might have. And uh, I'm thinking about that, it's defining you know, KPIs. It, it, it's coming up with the key performance indicators that really matter so that we're looking at the right things. We're knowing how we can affect things. And, and so when a CEO is wanting to make some type of decisions, that they need to be able to have the, the numbers to back it. And so I think that's a big role. And when I think about that, you think of the typical CFO in the past has been a cost cutter. I hear it a lot. It's, it's kind of a joke in, in the bank. It is, you know, people say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to buy two pens or two pencils. You know, they, they think that it's all about cost management. And I, I really think, for a strategic CFO to be a partner with the CEO, it, it needs to be kind of a shifted to a growth mindset and a revenue seeker instead of just a cost cutter. And I, I've tried to look at it that way because when we, in banking, one of our big numbers is our efficiency ratio. So how much do we spend for every dollar that we generate in revenue. And, and so when we start looking at that, there's two sides to that equation. And most people focus on the spend side, right? how much do I spend per dollar of revenue? And, and But there's two areas. So the revenue side, if you can grow that, but keep your cost the same, then, then that number gets better as well. So I think being able to focus on the areas that we can control and, and areas that where we can show growth and and benefit to the CEO is really a way for, for us to be more strategic in working with him. And then lastly, it, one of the, from that role, I think is, it's really about capital allocation. So how are we going to grow the smartest? So that's what I think of when I think of that capital allocation, there's different things we can do with our capital. We can pay it back in dividends. We can, you know, go out and buy it buy something, buy a bank, acquire a bank, or we can do buybacks. We, there's just a lot of different ways we can allocate that capital. And so I think the way to do that in a risk by minimizing risk, but maximizing our future growth is really a big part of what I want to do and what I want to be able to support my CEO with so that he can have that story to tell in, in his, his position as well. And I know we've touched on this a bit, but we hear a lot about data-driven decision-making these days. So first of all, what is data's role in becoming more strategic? And secondly, how can a CFO drive a culture that supports these types of data-driven decision-making? I think when you start talking about what that uh, data-driven decision-making and, and, and how our role falls into that. I think of several things and I kind of touched on it in, with the first question, but really moving from what happened to why did it happen and then what will happen and then how can we make it happen? Those, those are kind of a four step process that I think is important and why it's so important to be a data driven organization these days. And, and the CFO has to support that and drive those decisions. But but what that happened in the past, it's what happened. It's the reports, like you mentioned, looking back at what happened the last month or the last year. What we've started to come out to is what? Why did it happen? So finding the reason underneath those those numbers and then what will happen. And that's that's more of the modeling, being able to take it to the next level, take this data that we have and see where we projected to go in the future and then and then how can we make it happen wraps itself back around to the strategic side of being able to set a strategy off of that data. So a lot of times 
I think we, we take data and we look at it and we say, yeah, that's, that's data, it's, it's neat, but there's not any action off of it. So it's really a three-step thing. You have to have the data, then you have to have the insight about the data, and then you've got to take action based on the data. And so I think that's important. I don't think we're near uh, where we need to be on that. Uh, we start with dashboards a lot. That's uh, one way that CFOs and, and executives are able to get a, a snapshot picture of the data. And that's a, that's changed quite a bit over the last few years, obviously. But but then the next the next side is going to be more predictive, and that's being able to take the data and letting the machine and the and AI take that data and predict what the future will hold. And, and we worked with some S and P Global is one of our vendors, and and we work with them about some some new technology that they're looking at from a bank side to be able to do predictive analytics on what our customers want. And so being able to do that kind of thing is really the next level that we're not at yet, but I think that we'll get there. But again, from a CFO standpoint, it, it is it's measuring what is important. In the past, I think a lot of times we just did things because that was the easy way. It, it, those these calculations were what everybody used and, and they're easy to calculate, but that might not always been what we needed to be looking at. So I think from our standpoint, we need to be able to share the data that is important to, to those around us. We need to um, also not just gather data, but gather the right data. And uh, those things are important. And then I think on an executive level, you gotta have buy-in from the top. So we implemented when I started here, we didn't have really any kind of a dashboard or anything. And, and so we started implementing that and I used it a lot, but I really wanted it to be used by everybody across the, the company, but I was having a hard time getting buy-in on that because people are just not used to, don't like change a lot. So we had to get buy-in from our, my senior lender and, and he and I actually went out and visited each of our branches and did a workshop on how to set up their their dashboard and what they needed to be looking at, how they could manage from that. And, and those things were able to, to drive use across the com uh, company, but also it started to drive results. And, and one example is just, you know, we, we started measuring some of our fees that we had been waiving and, and started holding people accountable based off of these reporting and, and they could see that and it, it helped drive their attention to it. And once something that is driven to their attention, then they start managing and, and, and doing a better job of that. So I think those are ways we can affect the story. And then the last thing from a data driven culture, uh, I think this is something that I've really tried hard to work on. And I think we, a CFO has to, and, and needs to be, the driver of this is to share everything. We we have a culture of transparency, and so I I told employees that anytime they have a question about anything, they need to find out. They can let me know, and I I'll be happy to talk with them. So first off, is you got to be willing to share information. You got to try to educate your employees on the different data because if they don't know about it and they don't know the language or they don't know what goes behind the numbers, then they're really reluctant to use that data. And then it's also coming up with, their, you know, letting them know that it's important and that we're, we're willing to make decisions off of this data. So those are things that I think you have to have from a CFO standpoint and from a senior management standpoint to support those decision making and, and you got to empower people you got to give them the ability to, to make decisions off of the right data so th those are areas i think we've come a long way and we still got a long ways to go but i think that's really how how areas we can focus on to drive a data culture yeah well i think that that's great advice i think a lot of companies get it wrong because they think just putting in technology to 
collect the data is enough. And, and they really forget about the cultural change side of things, which, which I think is the hardest. I think I agree. And I, it's one of the things I get uh, the most and best feedback from some of the meetings that I'll, I'll present and, and really share and, and go behind the numbers. There's data that they can access and I've given them all access to that. And I know the reluctance to go out there and look at it because in, in a lot of ways it's just numbers. But if, once I'm able to share with them what things mean and, and how it affects areas, they're more apt to go look at that themselves and then be able to make decisions off of it. An example of that is we have a, a program where we share some incentive at the end of the year across the company based on income goals. Well, we share that. We're very transparent about that with our employees. And, and I'll share that at our monthly employee meeting. And, and I've had people come up to me and say, I love it. You know, we're trying to reach this goal. But how can I affect that? I'm, I'm just the, this or that. And so I really have been able to share with them certain ways they can impact that number. And it really helps drive a culture of a family because we all feel like we can contribute and make a difference in that bottom line number. So really education, I think, is super important across the organization. And it's, it's really taking, I really try to take on that role of being able to share that so that people get an understanding of what the business is. How does the business make money? How do we, how do we save money? How are, how are things set up? So I think that's a very important, instead of just throwing data at people like a fire hose and trying to hope that they get some of it. Okay. And, and lastly, so it, it's the job of a CFO to keep a lot of different parties happy. How can a CFO implement his or her vision across all stakeholders? We look at this, I look at this a lot because I think from a stakeholder, when we start thinking about in our organization, the stakeholders, we, we see our shareholders, we see employees, we see our customers, we deal with regulators, they're all shareholders or stakeholders, and then also our community because we, we're a community bank, so we try to be very involved in our communities that we serve and, and so those those all those stakeholders have a different need and sometimes they can they conflict so uh, employees obviously we want to take care of them but you know if i give everybody a huge huge raise then that might affect our stock value which our shareholders would like or maybe doing certain things would be beneficial for our customers, but the regulators would like it. So you've really got to take into account all of that and then create a story and share that with those people. And so we do that through, through our work in the community. They know where we come from, where we care, why we care and what we do here at the bank. We share that with our employees, as I've mentioned uh, several times, we share that with our shareholders a different story with them, even you know, at our shareholder meetings, but also with other co communications throughout the year, and then obviously with our regulators. And so I think the biggest thing for me is being able to juggle those conflicts of interest and, and create a story and that works for all of them and develop trust among all of them. With the, with the bank and, and ultimately that comes back to the why. And I, I, I say that a lot with, with the employees is we wanna we want know the why, we wanna share the why. So why are we doing what we're doing? And we do it for our community, we do it for our customers, we do it for our employees, we do it for our shareholders. So I think that's a, that's a shared message that we're able to share with all the constituents and, and be able to, to find find value and, and derive value for all of them across the board. Stephen, thank you so much for chatting with me today. I've thoroughly enjoyed speaking with you and learning about the evolving role of the CFO and its value. I found this to be incredibly informative and I hope our listeners have as well. And until next week, I wish you all safe and pleasant days ahead. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Megan. 
If you're ready to boost efficiency and streamline your accounting processes at significant cost savings, it's time to talk with Personiv. Their people-powered solutions have transformed the delivery of back office tasks and general accounting functions for decades, partnering with clients to provide everything from accounts payable to payroll services. See what Personiv can do for you by visiting personiv.com. You've been listening to CFO Weekly presented by Personiv. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to hear all of our episodes. Want to learn more? Check out personiv.com. Thanks for listening.